The book of Daniel is named after its writer and is a product of his time in Babylon as a Jewish exile from Israel. This biblical account is not only history, it's also prophecy. Known to be a key that helps unlock the book of Revelation, it contains visions of future significance in the coming of the Messiah and apocalyptic events thereafter. In both the historical and the prophetic sections, Daniel presents a strong case for the absolute sovereignty of God. This theme of sovereignty occurs on numerous occasions, including Daniel's deliverance from the lion's den, his friend's rescue from the fiery furnace, and the future arrival of the Ancient of Days to save his people from the forces of evil. As we look carefully into the book of Daniel, let us make sure that our theology works itself out practically in the way we live in light of eternity. Yes, the Babylonian culture may be closing in around us, but we will not bow down because greater is our king who lives inside of us. Okay, within chapter two, if you recall, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He has a recurring dream. He then calls his wise men, made up of what I'll call spiritual shysters, charlatans, astrologers, magicians, soothsayers, fortune tellers, present day psychics, tarot card readers, palm readers. He calls them to himself, and of course, he asks them for the dream and its interpretation. They say back to the king, you tell us the dream, and we'll tell you the interpretation. Of course, they had a dream book. They would take the imageries of any given dream, and they would go to that book, and they would give the interpretation, perhaps fabricated, perhaps even tapping into a demonic realm. We know all things are in spiritual realms, so you have to understand that even these things that are done by psychics present day, they're tapping into a very real realm. That's why the Bible calls it an abomination. We must be very careful when we're receiving anything from any other medium besides the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Now, they can't do it, and even though there's an exchange back and forth between them and the king, the king, he looks at them and realizes that they're trying to buy time. They're trying to get over on him. He puts out a decree, basically saying, if you can't do it, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to destroy your homes. If you can do it, I will bring honor upon you. Now, we know that they can't do it, so a decree goes out through all the land where he's going to eliminate the wise men. A knock comes at the door of Daniel. It's Arioch, that is the chief executionist. He tells Daniel the dilemma. Daniel says, what's the urgency? Daniel and his three companions were not, they were not exposed to that meeting. So now Daniel says, let me go to the king and ask for time. Now, it, we know it takes great courage for Daniel to even make such a request. The king, mindful that Daniel was part of his training program, we go back to chapter one where it says God gave favor to Daniel. So we must put all this together and realize God's favor on Daniel's life empowered him not only to have discernment, but discretion. He goes back to his house and he calls for a prayer meeting. Him and his three companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they pray to the God of heavens. They ask for his mercy. It tells us God reveals the secret to Daniel in a night vision. And there's this amazing explosion of praise in the form of a prayer where he tells us God is the one responsible for changing times and seasons, raising up kings and taking kings down, the one that reveals secrets. Now, that entire account sets the stage. It shows us the incompetence of man and it highlights the omnipotence of God. See, the incompetence of man will set the stage throughout the entire book of Daniel for the omnipotence of God to show off and show out. He chooses humans as his vessels. In the book of Daniel, he chooses Daniel to reveal his grace and his glory. And in chapter two, chapter seven, chapter eight, to show us that he has a grip on human history. So while we're panicking, God is sitting on his throne in complete control. Two major themes to be brought to the forefront of our minds. God's sovereignty over the world. God's complete sovereignty over the itinerary of the world. Not a single thing has happened in human history apart from God's sovereignty. Perfect in all that he has allowed. The second theme for you and I is the Christian's responsibility under the influence of the word of God. God's sovereignty over the world Yours and mine's responsibility under the influence of the word. 
Verse 24, Daniel has the, the revelation to the dream. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. I underline what I found to be most valuable within this first statement, Daniel's heart of compassion to his peers. Mind you, his peers were pagans. They very well deserved death. According to scriptures, according to what we know, they rejected God. They were diviners. They tapped into a spiritual realm. They were spiritual liars, so to speak. And yet Daniel's heart was one of intervention and intercession. Remarkable. Daniel intercedes on their behalf, which tells me something. Daniel's life became a light to those in spiritual darkness. Remember, the entire curriculum of Babylon with Daniel and his three companions and those in that three-year training program from chapter one, the entire curriculum was to indoctrinate them to worship the gods of Babylon. Now watch what Daniel does. Daniel, with his life, he's not gonna be indoctrinated by their gods. Oh no, he's gonna introduce to them the doctrine of his God. Huge comparison there. They wanted to influence him to be indoctrinated. That's brainwashed. And he, because of his convictions, he's gonna introduce them to the doctrine of his God. Well, how far and how wide would Daniel's influence go in the kingdom of Babylon? Well, first and foremost, we gotta understand that for you and I, a life of faithfulness will always be a light to those in spiritual darkness. Remember, these wise men, they were in spiritual darkness. Many of them may have not even realized what they were into. They may have operated out of ignorance, not necessarily being evil. There's a huge difference between the two. A lot of people walking around in darkness might be doing so because of ignorance. And you know what's gonna bring them out of that darkness? Your life, your example, your conduct, your character, your consistency, your life of faithfulness to a God who is faithful will be the very light that they're tracking that will bring them out of spiritual darkness. Why? Because God chooses you and I as his vessels to show off his glory and his grace. And we see this in Daniel's life because though his life eventually ended, you know what didn't end? His influence. 500 years later, we have a vignette, a beautiful vignette, it is often only brought out in December, and it's the wise men who traveled from the east by tracking a star in the sky that would bring them over a baby that would be born in Bethlehem. Matthew chapter 2 tells us, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men. Similar wording to what we're reading in Daniel, these Magi, these magistrates, these magicians, these astrologers, these men from the east of Orient descent, Babylonian or Persian, how did they have any working knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures to even know to follow a star that would bring them over a town called Bethlehem that would reveal to the world the Savior? They tell us they came from the east asking where is he who has been born king of the Jews? That's a title. That's a, that's a Jewish title. How did they have any clue about the Hebrew scriptures? Where is he born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Many Bible scholars, again, I reiterate, I've said this before, these wise men were influenced by the Hebrew scriptures. Where would that have started? What was the origin? It was Daniel in Babylon, in a foreign land, in a land of darkness, in a land where people worshiped other gods. It was Daniel and his three companions that introduced to them their God. And the influence would echo to this very day where we're looking at wise men, wise men that followed the light of a star that would lead them to the star of life. See, the Hebrew scriptures reveal as early as the book of Numbers, the Messiah was to be called a star, a star that shall come forth from Jacob. Jacob is the son of Isaac. Jacob became Israel, one of the tribes. He would be 
birth from one of the tribes. That's Numbers 24, 17. And then you go all the way to the end of the scriptures in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 16. And Jesus himself refers to himself as the bright and morning star. Remarkable. Remarkable how the word of God is perfect, intertwined from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And the wise men, though we always have the nativity scene and the wise men numbering three, we don't know how many wise men traveled. They most likely traveled in a caravan. This is Christmas 101. It was not three wise men. It may have well have been 30. It could have been 300. It was just three gifts. So it's easier to have three wise men, one with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But remarkably, this is Daniel's influence 500 years later on their lives. What's the point? Well, Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 is the point. Those who are wise, wise men, wise women, shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, like the heavens at night. Those who turn many over to righteousness, when you introduce people to the king of righteousness, it says, you shall shine like a star forever and ever. Now imagine if you and I let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. If they saw our visible works and they came to the conclusion about a vi an invisible God, imagine if you're that star, that star in the midst of somebody else's dark night and they're looking around for some semblance of hope. They're looking around for some form of direction. They don't know where to turn. All of the world's remedies always turned out to be empty and dissatisfied, and then your life shines on their life, and you become a star that brings them to the babe of Bethlehem. Imagine, imagine if our lives in our workplace became that star, that if they tracked and they traced and they followed and they watched, because they are watching, the non-believing world is watching, and they're looking for answers whether they're going to come up to you and ask you or not, inside they are scrutinizing and they're looking for an answer to the emptiness of the soul. And I would implore this church and you Christians that you would be mindful that you may be the only Bible that somebody reads and they're looking for peace, and it just might be the peace that you have that they crave. And when they ask the question, how are you so composed in a year that has been so chaotic? You can answer, well, I would love to introduce you to the one that I call Savior. And you become that star. Verse 25, watch what Arioch does here. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah. Notice how Arioch looks to take credit for the discovery. Now, when we backtrack, if you recall, he came to execute Daniel. Daniel asked for time, prayed to the God of heaven, revealed the secret, and he's the one that went back to Arioch and said, hey, I have the interpretation. But that's just a side point. Arioch looks to find some form of promotion, most likely by saying to the king, I have found one of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, they cannot declare to the king. Does that sound familiar? Remember, that was their response to the king. Your request, king, you're asking us to tell you the dream and the interpretation. There is no one in this realm that can do that. They weren't lying. Nobody could. Daniel brings that same thread back to the forefront of the king's mind. Why? Because Daniel wasn't any credit. He wants zero credit for what he's about to do. He does not want the king to think that it's in him or of him. Because verse 28 says, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. He literally, he puts a thick line, an impenetrable line between the world's wisdom and his God's wisdom. He is saying this secret that has been revealed to me has not come by any man, by any man's mind. This only came by my God. I love that. Remember, these astrologers, they studied the stars. 
the sky. They believed in the alignment of planets and stars based on different readings. And they would determine your destiny based on those alignments. And it's man's attempt at being wise. As I discussed last Thursday about what we would call someone who's a genius, yet those geniuses, if they do not return to their genesis, their wisdom is foolishness. And here, Daniel is making sure that we understand it's his God that can divine. Remember, to divine means to either through occultish practices or processes or rituals to try to provide insight into the future or somebody's problem. That's why psychics take advantage of people. They might ask a few probing questions to get you to reveal something about you or your circumstance, and then they will divine. But their mind being natural or degenerate cannot tap into the true divine. Oh, they might predict something that might come true. That's why they're general in their prophecies over lives. So we come to the conclusion that the minds of the world, all of them combined, all the minds of the world, they cannot divine or define the mind of the Lord. Who can? Paul would actually write to the Corinthians. He would say, the natural man does not understand the things of the spirit. He says, if you're a spiritual being and the Holy Spirit lives within you, you can understand the spiritual realm. You have wisdom that only God can give. He then says, who can instruct the mind of the Lord? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, when we have the mind of Christ, he is saying, you might not be able to instruct the Lord, but you have the instructions of the Lord. And you have the revelation of the Lord. And you have the interpretation of God's heart in his word. So before we get to the interpretation or the revelation that shaped human history, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, I want to spend a brief moment looking at the revelation that determines human destiny. Now don't, don't let me lose you here. See, human history, as we will discover it, is set by God in heaven. Psalm 103 verse 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom it rules over all. That's what it means to have human history being set like an itinerary by the God of heaven. Human destiny, however, oh, that is determined by your response to God on earth. That is determined by how you respond to the one we call Jesus, the one they described as Emmanuel, God with us, the one that John said was the word who became flesh, the one who the writer of Hebrews began the first chapter and the first several verses like this, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke to the fathers through the prophets, the chosen vehicles to communicate God's message was prophets. He then says, in these last days, spoken to us by his son. His son is his final revelation to humanity. He then goes on to say who he appointed heir of all things through whom he created the world. So can I introduce you to Jesus tonight? Jesus is not the founder of a religion. Jesus is the founder of the world. Big difference. He is the brightness of God's glory. He is the express image of the invisible God. In other words, he is the character revealed of the invisible God who upholds all things by the word of his power. This is Jesus. He literally holds all things together by his power. He holds this universe together. And when he decides to let go, it's gonna come undone. He holds your life together. He holds your life together spiritually. He holds your life together emotionally. And according to Colossians, in him, all things consist. He holds your life together together physiologically. Jesus Christ holds your life together, which means if it has touched your life, it had to pass through the scarred hands of Jesus Christ. And because he loves you so much, there's always a divine purpose in everything he has allowed. This is the greatest revelation to humanity. We don't have to know about anything else except Jesus Christ revealed 
in the flesh. According to Mark chapter one, verse 15, these are the first letters or words in red. If you have red letters, red words in your Bible, these are the words of Jesus. In Mark chapter one, he just gets baptized by the Holy Spirit. He comes out of the wilderness and these are his first words in ministry. To be noted, Mark chapter one, verse 15. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Consider the weight of what he said. I mean, that's the gospel. When he said the time is fulfilled, please understand what he was saying. He was saying, I am the fulfillment of time. All of human history was pointed at me. All of time literally finds its purpose in me. I bring it up. It's worth saying again. I think it's so amazing to use as an imagery. Consider how time is measured by his birth. Time counts down in what we call BC. It means before Christ until they secularized it and tried to make it sound like before common error, BCE. But it's before Christ. And I know that my life before Christ was on its way down, down to hell. My time was running out. But when I came to Christ, my time began to count up, upward to heaven. And that's why we call it AD, the year of our Lord, the favorable year of our Lord. Think about Jesus Christ's life and arrival on planet earth was the fulfillment of time. All time, according to scriptures, pointed to him and all time, according to how we respond to him, is appointed by him. Your eternal life tonight and your eternal death hang upon how you respond to the revelation that God gave humanity in his son, Jesus Christ. It is not a fable. It's not a made up story. It is a true historical happening that we have to go off of. It is the foundation of our entire faith. It's not just a Christmas story. Every time we come into December, even though we only pull out certain scriptures like Isaiah chapter nine, verse six and seven, for unto us, a child is born. That's his humanity. Unto us, a son is given. That's his divinity. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, of course, when Christ came, he brought the government of his father down to our level, the kingdom of heaven. Okay. But when I read that, put my Bible over here. When I read that, and I think about what else was on his shoulders, and I recognize that is also a form of government, the cross. See, the government is the responsibility of the people. And what you and I deserve, based on what we're responsible for, our sin, is death. And yet when Christ came, revealing the kingdom of heaven, he had the government of heaven upon his shoulders, but he decided to take that cross beam upon his shoulders to pay for your sin debt, to go to that cross so that you and I don't have to. And I see something there. The first time Christ came, he took a cross on his shoulders. The next time he comes, there's gonna be a crown and he is not gonna be executed on a cross. He's gonna come and execute the power of his crown. And he is gonna establish what the next part of the verse says, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it, establish it with judgment and justice. Ready? From that time forward, what time forward? From the time that he was born as a baby in a manger to the time that he would go to the cross and then raise from the dead three days later and then ascend back to his father from that time going forward forever and ever. Now, what is that time called? We call it the time of the Gentiles. It's the church age. It's the time that we're living in right now. Why am I staying here for a moment? Because we're about to go into the interpretation of the dream. And in the interpretation of the dream, we're gonna look at kingdoms that rose and fell from King Nebuchadnezzar and a kingdom that we're waiting to arise present day and the stage is being set and what is the church and the Christian's responsibility in the midst of all of it? Here's what Daniel says to the king. There's a God in heaven who reveals secrets 
and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. Verse 30, but as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. Look at the humility again. I, I, I was chosen not because I'm um, anything special. God, God chose me not because I'm smarter than everybody else, but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. What does Daniel do here? He doesn't grab the glory. He gives the glory. I don't know how many times in my own life I go to grab the glory and grab the attention. And Daniel, as a young man, has the spiritual attitude to give the glory. If there was ever a time before the most powerful king in the known world, as a captive in his court, to take the attention and take the promotion and take the glory, it's now. But I noticed something throughout the scriptures. Joseph's life in Genesis is a perfect parallel to Daniel's life. God places both these individuals as young men in foreign lands. He raises both these men up to be in positions of influence and power. Both of them went through trials. Joseph sold as a slave by his own brothers. They sell him to an Ishmaelite caravan. He finds himself in Potiphar's house, his master. He's serving as a slave. Potiphar's wife accuses him of rape. Potiphar thrusts him into the deeper part of the prison. And it was in that prison. And I always say, look at this. He's going backwards like a slingshot. Because God, when you understand God is always in every situation, and you trust him no matter how deep or how dark or how backwards you think you're going, when you turn to the heavens and say, God, I trust you, you better believe he's ready to let go. But your maturity needs to elevate to the responsibility. He meets a baker and a butler, other inmates, and it's in that place where they have troubling dreams, and Daniel, he says to them, or excuse me, what he, Joseph says to them what Daniel says to the king, don't all dream interpretations belong to God? He interprets their dreams. Their dreams come true. Two years go by, and the butler who gets out, gets his job back, he's within proximity of Pharaoh, who has a dream. I'm giving you Bible history here. And Pharaoh, troubled by his dream, like Nebuchadnezzar, and the butler finally says, I know a young man that I did jail time with. I don't know where he's at, but he interpreted my dream. They summon him. And in the day, Joseph says the same thing to Pharaoh. It is not in me, but God will give you an answer of peace. Genesis chapter 41, verse 16. Here's the point. God isn't looking to use great people. God is looking for people who dare to prove he is great. God is looking for young men and young women who say a prayer every morning, Lord, make much of yourself through me. God is looking for hearts of humility. See how David was chosen in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. Do you recall it? Samuel was sent by God to anoint the next king. Jesse's seven sons are lined up. You better believe they were very impressive, physically speaking, beautiful, and every time Samuel convinced himself this must be the next king. God said to Samuel, the Lord doesn't see as you see. You look at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. God is looking for a heart. Second Chronicles 16.9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole world. Billions of people. And God says, I'm looking for a heart that is loyal to me so I could stand strong behind it. Imagine a community that believed that God is looking for a heart like yours, a heart after 
his heart so that he could stand strong, show himself strong on your behalf. Oh, he's not looking for people of great ability. I'll tell you what he's looking for. He's looking for people of availability. Anybody that says, here I am, Lord, use me. Here I am, Lord, send me. Send me into that public school. Send me into that secular realm. Send me so that I can be a light in a dark place. Verse 31, you, O king, were watching, and behold, here we go, a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you. Now imagine King Nebuchadnezzar, he's the only one that has recollection of the dream. And now Daniel starts to touch on the imagery of his dream. Great image, splendor, excellent. It stood before you. Its form was awesome. This image is, now he describes it. The image's head was of fine gold, chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. This is perhaps what King Nebuchadnezzar saw in his recurring dream. He saw a head of gold, and as you work your way down, he saw arms and a chest of silver. Take note of the metals. We're gonna discover by value, they decrease, but by strength, they increase. He then notices in the rib section, going down into the thighs, bronze, a bronze. And then the legs turn into iron, two legs. And the iron of the legs, if you can notice, they bleed into the feet, which is mixed partly with that iron, which tells us something, something about the legs is gonna show up in the feet with the, the dream interpretation. And it's mixed with clay. Verse 34, in his dream, as you may have very vivid dreams, there's animation. And the animation of the statue within the dream unfolds like this. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands. Okay, supernatural happening, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay. Okay, now we're at the feet of iron and clay. This giant stone strikes the base, the foundation, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, are you picturing it? Were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. What did he see? He saw this stone that was made without hands. It appeared out of a mountain, as we'll discover later on in the text. And it comes out of nowhere and it strikes the statue at its base. Where? The foundation, the most vulnerable part of the statue. And from the bottom all the way up, it begins to crumble. That's the description. Now onto the decryption, or as Daniel says, the interpretation. Verse 36. This is the dream. Now we tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Right there, he tells us what King Nebuchadnezzar saw, the head of gold, that is typified as his very kingdom, the kingdom that he's currently reigning in, the kingdom that Daniel is a captive to. It is that very kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom. He says in verse 39, but after you, okay, after Nebuchadnezzar shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours. That would explain the gold moving to silver. Then another, a third kingdom, bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron, ready, shall be in it. In what? In the feet. Just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. 
And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. What is going on here? Okay. Daniel is interpreting the image in the dream, the statue that we just looked at, the head of gold being the Babylon Empire. We know from history that the Babylon Empire reigned and ruled under King Nebuchadnezzar from 605 BC to approximately 539 BC. Babylon was known as the golden city. It was known for its gold. It was an absolute monarchy, which means King Nebuchadnezzar, he was the law of the land. He did not operate based on a law outside of him. He was the law. What he said went. In approximately 539 BC, history tells us the chest and arms of silver is typified by the Medo-Persian empire that was led by Cyrus the Great. That kingdom would span from 539 BC to approximately 331 BC. Cyrus the Great, he would take silver and he would actually use it as money. It was the monetary value that silver held and he used it widely to advance his kingdom. They were taken over by the Greek empire, which is typified by bronze. Many say that under the leadership of Alexander the Great, and we'll get more into him in chapter seven and chapter eight, And this is how we know these are the kingdoms or the empires that are represented here. Daniel tells us later on in the book, from 331 BC to approximately 146 BC, Alexander the Great's kingdom conquered the known world at the time widely and vastly like none other Alexander the Great. But there was another kingdom that would eventually come on the scene and it's typified by the legs of iron. Two legs, this kingdom or this empire would be divided into an east and a west. It was the Roman Empire. They were, in comparison to the other forms of government, now I want you to understand this, gold, silver, bronze, iron, and then a mixture in the feet. Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute monarchy, full authority, Cyrus the Great operated out of a constitutional monarchy, which means there was an actual Medo-Persian law that he was held to. And then Alexander the Great, he didn't have a successor after he died at age 33. So his four generals took over his kingdom and it became an oligarchy. Notice how the governmental structure is changing as you go down the statue from gold now to bronze. Now Rome, Rome was a democratic imperialism which meant they used military might and diplomacy to crush people into submission. The Roman Empire was typified by silver. They actually made, made, excuse me, made iron the choice metal for weaponry and their army. They were known as the Iron Legions. During the birth of Jesus Christ, The Romans were in power, were they not? It was a time in human history called the Pax Romana. Okay, Pax Romana means peace, Roman, the peace of Rome. And they would force people into that peace. So though it was a false peace, it provided the setting for the most development up to this point in human history, look at me, of highways, byways, commerce, and trade One language, the Greek language, which would explain why the entire New Testament is written in Greek. It was like a one world at the time order. And this was the exact time that God decided to send Jesus. Why? So that the gospel can spread rapidly on all the highways and the byways. The stage was set perfectly. And when Jesus walked into his ministry, he looked at the hub of religion, Jerusalem, And he looked at the temple where all of religious life revolved, even in the Middle East. And he made a prediction, a prophecy. And he said, that temple, 
will be destroyed. It was laughable at the time. In 70 AD, General Titus came in and burnt the entire city to ruins. The entire temple was literally destroyed, which fulfilled the words of Christ, which would begin the time of the Gentiles, which was the birth of the church. And the church and the age of the church is what's called the age of grace. And we carry the gospel message forward where we point to anyone and we tell them they can have forgiveness of sins from anything they have done. And then something happened that should have never happened. It's never happened in human history. Anytime any civilization is overtaken by another civilization, they're swallowed by it. Just as Babylon was swallowed by Medo-Persian, just as Medo-Persian was swallowed by Greece, and just as Greece was swallowed by Rome. And then Israel and Jerusalem were swallowed by the Roman Empire. Yet in 1948, May 14th, we see that Israel was given their country back. The whole world sympathized with the Jews at the time because of World War II. And God had prophesied that his people would be scattered globally, and that happened. And then in 1948, May 14th, when the birth of Israel happened, the Jews from all around the world came back to their homeland. Soon after the birth of Israel, you know what happened? A few European countries signed what is called the Treaty of Rome. At the time, it was known as the European Common Market. It was the attempt to have a commerce for those nations. It's where they created the euro. Today, that exact organization is called the European Union. The European Union is 27 countries. Many Bible scholars believe that the European Union or the United Nations or some other geopolitical organization can be seen in the 10 toes of the statue. It is a revived Roman empire. Just as the iron bleeds into the feet, Daniel chapter seven and Revelation chapter 17, it introduces us to 10 kings. 10 toes, 10 kings, a revived Roman empire is gonna form, it's gonna be a confederation of nations, loosely aligned, and it's from that organization, that alignment, that the Bible tells us the Antichrist will come through. We are seeing the unfolding of prophecy. It is not far-fetched to say that that 27-country confederation could one day become 10 countries in align with one another, partly strong, partly weak, like the revived Roman Empire of iron mixed with clay. It makes sense when it tells us that the Antichrist will influence three of those 10 nations, making himself more powerful and the people are looking for a solution. So they're gonna give him their authority and then he's gonna broker a deal. Revelation tells us a seven year deal of peace in the Middle East. We just saw a deal brokered in the Middle East. It was with Arab nations and Israel. Ezekiel chapter 38 tells us that there needs to be peace on all borders of Israel. So I'm telling you several pieces of the prophetic puzzle that if you're a Christian, you should be mindful of because you're living in a time in human history where we're able to look back and see these kingdoms, they found their fulfillment. They've risen and they've fallen. But that final one, the feet of iron and clay, the revived Roman empire, it is active to this present day and we're waiting and watching. But hey, look at me. I know it might sound like a little apocalyptic, might sound very movie-esque, but here's how the Christian should view these coming empires. Verse 44, and in the days of these kings, which kings? The ten toes. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Who's the stone? It's Jesus Christ. The first time he came, 
he became a stumbling stone. No Jew wanted to claim Jesus as their Messiah. They expected a king like David to come forth, not a son of a carpenter, not a guy from Nazareth, not a guy that would end up on a cross. So he became a stumbling stone to them. But if you know your scriptures, Jesus Christ became a chief cornerstone to us. He is the one that completes the building. He is the most important foundational piece of our faith. And according to Matthew chapter 21, listen to Jesus's own words to the religious elite, verses 42 to 44. He says, Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, stumbling stone, has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Ready? And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind them to powder. Choice for everybody in this room tonight. You can make a decision to fall before the stone, to be broken before him, or if you've never given your life over to the Lord, time is running out and you will eventually be broken by him. See, God has dominion over man's domain. And while we're in this age of grace, we have an opportunity to receive his forgiveness and be broken before him, to surrender to him. But when the time that Jesus returns, according to the scriptures, you're gonna have no choice. And the Bible says you'll be broken by him. The Bible says, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, that can happen tonight willfully, where you say, I'm gonna bow the knee of my heart. I'm gonna be broken before the stone. Or if there's rejection there, which God gives us the free will to do, when he returns or he calls your time, you'll be broken by him. I say, choose him as savior now, because he's gonna be judge later. See, the gospel today has never been more important, has never been more potent. See, just when Jesus came at the perfect time in human history, where the gospel was able to go on the highways and the byways and travel around the world, what do you think today is? We've never had more avenues to share the gospel today. And what I'm seeing is a church that is more concerned with people's feelings than people's fate. We should be more concerned where people are going to spend eternity and pastors are coming behind a pulpit and they're worried about offending people. I won't bring up politics in the pulpit. No, no, if you don't want politics in the pulpit, then you're saying you don't want God in government. And we just got done looking at a history where God is establishing governments. I just want God in my government. Somebody's queuing up an email. <laughs> Verse 46, let's complete this. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, ready? This is a pagan king. Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him rule over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over the wise men of Babylon. Also Daniel petitioned the king, and he set his boys in order, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Here's what I reduce that entire passage to. You ready? Only the Lord can take a man who was about to be executed to make him an executive. Only Lord can take a young man from the pit to the prison to the palace. And oh yeah, by the way, the tool was his brother's malice. Only the Lord can take a convicted felon and put him back on solid ground as a convicted Christian and have him understand that the conviction that the Lord gave me will always weigh more than the conviction that the world gave me. 
He can take anyone from anywhere who's done anything if you just give him access to your heart so we can choose to be broken and surrender to him tonight because he's that starlight in the sky. And he wants to use your life. Come on. That's like the applause at the Apollo. You remember the Apollo? It's like time to get off the stage. <laughs> All right, let's close this down and we're gonna worship our way out of here tonight. Keep in mind, it is the incompetence of man that will always set the stage for the omnipotence of God. And like the wise men tracked and traced a star and it brought them to Jesus, would to God that your life would be that light that would bring people to the Christ. We can choose to be broken before him. One day, those that do not bow the knee will be broken by him. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it tonight. By God's good grace, let's do it. God bless.